Good evening. Oh, we can do better than that. Y'all, come on now. Good evening. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for coming out. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin Young, the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, my mom always likes to say, call me instead the person who can finally get her tickets. So this, I'm really glad you're here uh, and didn't have to call me to get in. Um, as the museum several, celebrates Black History Month this year, we're uplifting African American artists who have used creativity as a path for change. It's so meaningful then to welcome B. Michael to the museum tonight. A visionary of design whose artistry has broken new ground in the world of high fashion, here at the museum, our design collections reflect the impact of African American inspiration, imagination, and innovation. Celebrating black makers who've shaped American culture and our built environment and our very lives. B. Michael is one of many of the esteemed group of designers we have represented in the museum's fashion collections, <clears throat> showcasing his talent, technique, and eye for form alongside other greats like Anne Lowe, May Reeves, Arthur McGee, Willie Smith, and several others. I needn't tell you all in this crowd tonight that style is well important to black folks. My mom's biggest compliment growing up was that someone was a classy lady. That was the tops. And I see some class in here tonight. I know we're gonna see more later. Um, one of my favorite things about uh, black style one of my, is one of my favorite quotes that's here in the museum. And that's by George C. Wolfe who said, quote, God created black people and black people created style. <laughs> you can find that quote and so much else in our culture galleries, which are focused on the fourth floor. But culture and history, of course, courses throughout the museum. I think so much about this idea of black creators and style, and that will be on view tonight. You know, we just uh, are now entering what's going to be in September, our eighth year, and we've had 10.6 million visitors to the museum. And thinking about, that's worth an applause, I think. <clears throat> and that goodly number is so exciting and so important because uh, even after the, this is with the pandemic and with those years where we were, had reduced numbers for safety, um, I still see the ways that people return to the museum excited, emboldened, and for events like this to really explore the black imagination and black experience. I see the ways that people want to discover themselves and each other in the museum. And one of the things I love about the 10 millionth visitor who we celebrated just a little bit after our seventh anniversary in the fall, uh, that person was in the museum for a book club. They were just in our cafe to meet with their sisters to connect over books and reading and learning. And that's very much the spirit of how people think of the museum as theirs. They think of it as a place of pilgrimage, a place of return. 77% of our visitors are first time visitors still. People are still discovering us, still exploring. But that also means that the remaining 23% are returning. And what I find is they're not here for the first time or the second time, they're here for the 10th time. And that's really exciting to ha happen. And so I'm really happy to have you here tonight to encapsulate the museum's commitment to the idea of living history. And that's the idea that history is in you, it's in all of us, and especially it's important for our young people to know that history is something they too can make. And we're here tonight to talk about the collecting and telling the story of the new and the now. And it's really a pleasure to host B. Michael tonight to reflect on his extraordinary career and unique bond with Cicely Tyson, another groundbreaking artist in tonight's conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to welcome Denise Robinson Sims, Associate Director of External Affairs at the museum to introduce our panelists. Thanks again. Thank you, Director Young. Good evening, everyone. I'm so grateful that you're here with us uh, for tonight's conversation with a truly singular designer whose work has had an indelible impact on the world of fashion and beyond. Inspired by his mother's creativity and his grandmother's keen sense of style, the one and only B. Michael studied at the New York Fashion Institute of Technology and worked under icons such as Oscar de la Renta. He soon launched his namesake millinery line in 1999, 
launched his first couture collection, and in 2016 was awarded the prestigious Design Visionary Award by Lighthouse Guild. B. Michael has created renowned haute couture looks for Valerie Simpson, Beyonce, Nancy Wilson, Susan Fales Hill, Brandy, and of course, the designer's great muse and friend, the iconic Cicely Tyson. When Gail King asked Miss Tyson what we should remember about her when the time comes, Miss Tyson stated, I've done my best. Tonight, we are so fortunate to be able to hear about the best and about the unique bond B. Michael had with Miss Tyson. As written in his new book, Muse, Cicely Tyson and Me, a relationship forged in fashion. Like you all, I cannot wait to hear his reflections on his career and stories about what it was like to dress the award-winning actress for so many of her extraordinary career milestones, including the evening in 2019 when he became the first black American luxury fashion designer to dress an Oscar recipient, Ms. Tyson, for her history-making red carpet moment. Tonight, B. Michael is joined in conversation by his longtime friend, Susan Fales Hill. She's an award-winning television writer, producer, author, and arts advocate. Fales Hill is executive producer and writer of the series, and just like that. She's also one of Hollywood's few female and youngest showrunners. She's the author of four books, including her memoir, Always Wear Joy, which I think now is now my new daily affirmation. <laughs> She serves on the boards of St. Paul's School and the American Ballet Theater, which awarded her the Melville Strauss Award, the organization's highest honor. Please silence your cell phones, sit back, or you can sit on the edge of your seats all night. Listen to two dear friends discussing an extraordinary life. I know by the end of this evening, we will all agree that he has also done his best. Without further ado, please welcome to the stage Susan Fales Hill and B. Michael. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I am wearing a B. Michael, made especially for this occasion to match the Chaz Guest painting and the genius of finding a fabric that actually echoed the background of the painting. That's pure B. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you all for coming. And B, I'm so excited for you and this book. Uh, you're a friend of mine for a quarter of a century. Cicely, I knew all my life because she was dear friends with my mother, Josephine Premise, and they performed together. And I learned new things about her and about you reading your book. You touch on extraordinary themes, the divine continuum of black excellence and the community of black artists of which you were a part and she is, is and was a part. Um, the uh, fashion as statecraft and fashion and style as a branch of the civil rights movement. As I like to say, we shall overcome in couture. <laughs> Amen. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Bill Cunningham, the great photographer, used to say, fashion is the armor with which we get through daily life. And that, I think, goes exponentially, is exponentially true for, for us. And then finally, the sacred act of witnessing, remembering, and recording. I'm so glad that you've taken the time to actually reflect on your journey with her and record it for all posterity. You were with her for the last 15 years of her life. And the first question I want to ask you is, when did you decide to, to write this book? She always used to say she was going to write a book when she had something to say. When right. did you decide that you had something to say? Interesting. I said to Cicely in 2020 mm -hmm. that I want to do a book. We've talked about it, um, she, Mark Anthony, and I, about the idea of sharing what we had accomplished in both of our industries. And I thought, OK, this is a great time. It felt like you know, I'm practicing working with you on your book. And she said, well, I love the idea, but first let me finish my book. Okay. And so she did her book published on January 26, 
of 2021. Mm -hmm. And then she went to sleep on January 28th yep. of 2021. And so I put the book on the back burner for a bit. And did it, what motivated you to get back to it? You know, going back to the book. Okay, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the publisher called me and gave me some time and mm -hmm. said, are you ready to go back to your project? And I found doing the book was very cathartic for me because mm -hmm. it allowed me to relive all the moments. Literally, we had a thousand photos all over the apartment. I mean, the dining room was crazy. Mm -hmm. and But it allowed me to just revisit and feel Cicely's presence as we went from the beginning and through all of those moments. So it was a great journey and a way through those pages to keep her alive and to keep her relevant well, in our lives. Because in your beautiful eulogy at her funeral, you said you had phantom limb syndrome. You spoke to her three times a day and suddenly she was gone. And so it was a way of reclaiming that limb. Uh, absolutely, and feeling that presence and being able to use that arm that we think is gone, for sure. So I want to briefly touch on you and what made you the designer that you are. And it all begins with your first muse and your first client, your <laughs> grandmother Minerva. Yes, absolutely. Who taught you that uh, style had nothing to do with money. Word to the mob wife crowd. So. <laughs> If she's listening. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, my grandmother had this theory, that, you know, you buy quality. You, if you don't buy five bad dresses a year, you buy one good dress mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. And she would bring me shopping and, you know, teach me to touch fabric and mm -hmm. make those kinds of choices. So at the end, when the saleswoman would say to her, we called her Minnie, so Minnie, which dress do you want? And she'd say, well, let my grandson decide. <laughs> and at that stage, I'm 11 years old. But she was wise, and I made good choices. <laughs> <laughs> and her, her sense of excellence and the eternity of fashion is something that you've continued. Yes, and you know, understanding, again, that it's about excellence in fashion, it's about quality, craftsmanship, good fabrics, and I want to believe that I do continue that, you yes. You do, absolutely. So you began as a milliner. What made you decide to embark on a career of making beautiful couture gowns? I mean, I can't say that I was that smart, <laughs> <laughs> except what I can say is I studied designers like Coco Chanel, mm -hmm. and Coco Chanel started her career as a millinery designer. Mm -hmm. And then I was also fascinated by Halston, and he started his career as a millinery designer. And so I just kind of thought, well, that's the club that I am supposed to be a member of. Mm -hmm. And I always had a love, speaking of my grandmother, for hats. And so having had that exposure and starting to redesign her hats, it just seemed like the organic, natural way for me to begin. Well, and you'd probably learned a lot about structure from doing You learn about structure and you learn in terms of textile mixing. So yes, mathematics in terms of making a hat. So it's a great start, absolutely. And a good club. <laughs> so that was in 1999. We're gonna zoom forward to 2005 when a fateful call occurred. So I had run into Aunt Cicely and she was getting ready for the Legends Ball, Oprah's Legends Ball, which she held for black female artists yes. who had really changed the culture. And she said, I, I, you, you're wearing this wonderful young man. And so I think then she gave his, his number, your number to, uh, to Joey. Joey Mills, the yes. legendary makeup artist. Legendary. And yes. so he called you and Tell us about this this first meeting with right. she's Joey 81 called. years old, yes. legend of a woman. Joey called and said, I'm here with Cicely Tyson, and she wants to know if you will dress her for Oprah's ball, as you just said. And I said, yes, of course. And then he says, well, I'm here. she's here now and wants to come right over. <laughs> Not something that happens every day. Right, like, can, you know, can I make an appointment for next week? <laughs> She's on her way, so she comes 30 minutes. Cicely Tyson is standing at the door of my atelier, 
and I had no time to process this. I only know her as Rebecca running through the field or Miss Jane Pittman, yes, going to the fountain. And so now she's standing at my door, not dressed up, and I have to now envision her in a ball gown. And she said, and you only have five days to do this. <laughs> so what was that process? How did you decide on what you ultimately chose, which was a beautiful white blouse and a very elegant black skirt? How did you? Well, you know, when Cicely said, the one thing Oprah wants us to wear is any variation of black and white. And so when I decided, I had just done a collection, mm -hmm. and the blouse and the skirt were in the collection, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, well, if I only have five days, I have to work from at least a drape that we currently, a current model. And so when I presented the idea of a blouse and skirt, and, as, and now it makes sense because, you know, Cicely was out of the box in terms of rules. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a blouse and skirt for a ball appealed to her. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I did chose the blouse. The skirt happened to have been a skirt that I had just put on Beyonce for her CD cover. But for me, you know, Beyonce's was in champagne and Cicely wore it in black. And that was our beginning. Different very different, and I also love that I can dress a Cicely Tyson and a Beyonce in the same skirt because I think that makes me brilliant. It does make me <laughs> <laughs> And so you are, Blanche, you are. Um, so she immediately adopted you. I mean, yes. that was the, as, as you always say, God had a bigger plan. Absolutely. And um, so you began going to a lot of events together, one of which we must give a nod to uh, a designer who is in the collection of this museum and who was mentioned uh, by the August director of the museum, Arthur McGee, on yes. whose shoulders you and so many other black designers stand. You got to go together, you and Cicely, to his honoring at the Metropolitan Museum, which has one of the most important fashion collections. Can you talk a little bit about what that meant? That was so meaningful because I will say that when the museum contacted me to be on the committee for that event, I did not know who Arthur McGee was. And I consider myself, you know, a person who studies and, and I just thought, how could I not know Arthur McGee? So obviously I did a crash course. And then when I asked Cicely to join us for the event, she got excited, and whatever I did not know about Arthur McGee, Cicely filled me in. All the ladies wore him. My mother wore him. She did. Diane Carroll did. He was, he was the go-to man. It, it was mind-blowing. And so, and Arthur McGee was alive and well at the time, and he came to the event at the Met. Cicely spoke, and I inserted myself in his life until he died. Yeah. I mean, he really became the uncle in the business that I didn't have. No, and he had helped forge the path. He was the first black designer to have a showroom, uh, to Absolutely. head a design Absolutely, yes, and on 7th Avenue. Exactly. I mean, that was just amazing to me, yes. But the fact that you didn't know about him speaks to the problem of erasure in American history. Yes. And again, underscores why it's so important that you have told this story. Thank you, it so is important, yes. 2009 is also the year that um, Cicely stopped dabbling around with other designers. <laughs> Obviously, everyone wanted to dress her. She wore a lot of Issei Miyake, and you were styling her for the Emmys in a Issei Miyake, and she turned to you that evening. She didn't win the Emmy that she was nominated right. for, and she said, you know, it's got to be just you. You're going to be my exclusive designer. What do you think motivated that decision? It's one of those things, you know, maybe this will resonate. Imagine you're dating someone for a very long time <laughs> and you're seen together a lot and people assume you're married and now spontaneously <laughs> you say to the other, I think it's time for us to get married. <laughs> and Cicely caught me off guard that way. I mean, we're at the table and you know, I probably was on my second glass of Chardonnay yeah. and she made this comment and I looked at her face and saw that she meant it, mm -hmm. and instantly I realized that she was giving me a charge, 
and that she, that I had to be responsible and trustworthy with that charge. And I embraced it and we never looked back. No. We didn't even have the conversation a lot after she made the statement. Mm -hmm. It's like, here it is. Mm -hmm. And so it was very, very, you know, one of those moments. No, I, uh realizing this yes. is what's meant to be this is what's why meant am to i be. wasting time with anyone else absolutely and loyalty to you was unwavering unwavering she had everyone else coming at her yes which is it's also so important to stand up for each other again that that connection and that divine continuum if we don't wear our designers who is going to do that and you know for sicily it was so important yes <laughs> And for Cicely, it was so important because she shared with me that early on in her career, designers did not reach out, you know, wanting to dress the black actors or actresses. And so, you know, now we move to another time and it's just like, but that's not what it was like. Yeah. So she felt she brought some of that along, you know? Absolutely. Yes, definitely. Uh, well, her commitment to our people was yes. unwavering. The two of you were together at uh, Lena Horne's funeral, and she said something that she said at every funeral. Of, she saw so many of her friends and contemporaries pass away before her. She said, I don't know why I'm still here, and it must be because God has something else for me to do. Well, I can tell you all why she lasted longer than everyone else when everyone in my mother's living room was knocking back the cocktails. <laughs> Francisley was juicing. To everyone else, the fifth food group was a Don Perignon Champagne, and she was there with her, her green juice. So she really took care of her health. She did, yes. Uh, but I also think that God kept her here, A, to do some groundbreaking roles, and B, to receive all the accolades that were denied her early in her career, and the accolades that some of her contemporaries never received. So we're gonna do a little round of some of the beautiful looks that you created for some of these epic moments. Uh, and I think there's a, a consistent theme of sustainability, uh, regalness, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sort of eternal classicism. So we're gonna start with and that's where we start. <laughs> we start. We start with, she won the Tony, the oldest person ever to win the Tony at 88 for the trip to Bountiful, a Horton Foot play, which was right. not written for African-American actors. Um, and at, in her speech, her acceptance speech, she said, I said to God, I don't want to be greedy, but I just want one more great role. Uh, and it was her first time back on stage in 30 years. And you know, the show was extended at least twice. And Cicely is the only member of the cast that performed every show. Nope, she never, never missed, missed the performance. Hello, that juice. The juice. Yes, and exactly. The, forget the Chardonnay, stick to the juice. Tell us, please, about what inspired this. The color, what was... Because it was her first Tony, I knew she was going to win. It was impossible for her not to. And I felt like I cannot put you in a pretty dress. It needs to be something. And the dress was not meant to be what we're looking at. My initial sketch was a little less than this, but as we're draping and the fabric just kept growing and we kept ordering more yards of fabric <laughs> <laughs> for the dress to continue to grow and it became this piece of sculpture that Cicely did not see. Mm -hmm. until maybe the day before. Mm -hmm. And when she saw the dress, she screamed and just thought, oh my God, even if I don't win was her thought, you know, I'm I've wearing this dress. dress. Absolutely. So interesting, erasure. Uh, no one ever asked who had made her dress. On the red carpet, she's walking the red carpet and no one said, who made your dress, Cicely? Yeah, so, but now let the record show. Yes, Los uh, Angeles Times, got an exclusive, they thought, and said, we found out who made Cicely Tyson's dress. B. Michael made the dress. So, and I thought, all you had to do was ask. I'm <laughs> owning it. Someone called it a purple scrunchie. I said, I own that, too. <laughs> that, that same person is now rocking the mob wife look. So, yes. But enough said. Um, she then received the Kennedy Center honors, which she thought would be sort of the pinnacle, that there would be nothing, no great honor coming right. after that. Tell us about this beautiful gold gown. It's interesting when she got the call that she would receive the Kennedy Center honors and we're talking about the event and the evening, Cicely said to me, 
you better do a beautiful dress because this is my last biggie. But of course, I knew better. And uh, I said, I will do a great dress, but this is not your last. No. And so the dress in the gold, I thought, because of the multicolor of the metal, yes. it would be great. But I also know that when you design a dress for a Cicely Tyson, who began her career as a model, if the dress has something interesting or something to flirt with, she knows what to do with it. So this dress has all of these points as a, the uh, cuff of the bolero. And one of my favorite photos of the evening is Cicely waving to the audience with all of the points cascading. <laughs> and while you all thought she was being gracious, she was like, I am still a model. I'm working this way. <laughs> yes. The royal wave. The royal wave. Uh, and then, outdoing herself, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from our eternal president, Mr. Yes. Obama. And here she is upstaging Bill Gates. Uh, and you have her. Oh, I did not dress for that either. <laughs> <laughs> you have her in a red wool boucle shift and coat over it, what your grandmother would call a walking suit. So Correct. Tell us a little bit about what that is. So I chose the color. It's more of an autumn red as opposed mm -hmm. to just a tomato red. Correct. And I also wanted it, it's daytime, and I love day clothing. And I just saw this as an opportunity to really elevate, you know, a day look that's very sophisticated and appropriate for the occasion. I knew that Sicily would be sharing that day with many others. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't have, you know, a piece that just screamed, I'm the only one here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but she loved it and I enjoyed, I loved the idea of it and I felt it was appropriate for the occasion. I also, looking at this beautiful bob, she wore wigs as an accessory. Yes, so yes. We, I mean, we have, you have no idea the number of wigs. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I grew up with a wig wearer, so I, I, know, the, I know the drill. Uh, she was honored by the American Theater Wing. Yes. And Latanya Jackson, the wife of Samuel Jackson, a wonderful director and actor in her own right, uh, gave her the call that she was receiving this. Tell us about this incredible ensemble to which someone asked her, is that a Dior? And she said, no, it's by someone equally important, B. Michael. And that was her quote, yes. <laughs> so I, again, saw Cicely as Hollywood royalty. Mm -hmm. And that night, I'm thinking that she is truly theater. You know, she is you know, arriving I thought it was such a, an important moment, again, on the heels of coming back to the stage yes. that they would honor her this way. And so I just felt we needed something really theatrical, but also in great taste. And it's a two-piece. It's a demi-opera coat and then a sheath uh, with a trumpet bottom underneath. And the first time I managed to get her to wear a gray wig. It's divine. And then we fell in love with it because it's just so Making gorgeous. Me think I need to cancel my appointment with <laughs> At the funeral of Aretha Franklin, and Aretha sang in a tribute to her when she received the Kennedy Center honor. They were lifelong friends. And this was, you said, one time when she did not agree with you and you said she, yes. she should wear this hat. So please tell us. We are preparing to get to the church, zip up, and here's the hat, Cicely. I am not wearing that hat. People sitting behind me will say, I can't see. <laughs> and I said, no one is going to tell Cicely Tyson that your hat is blocking me. <laughs> so I tell this joke. I did have a smaller hat with me that I never presented. And so she didn't even know there was an option. So I said, the car is downstairs. We have to go. And she put the hat on. And I have to say that when we walked into the church, there was like a hush as the queen arrived. And it was just almost supernatural. And when we left the church eight hours later, the length of Aretha's funeral, <laughs> that's for real, get into the car and I turned on my phone and we realized that the hat had gone viral. 
And it just became another moment. And Cicely would say, it's the first time I've been upstaged by a hat. <laughs> And then a real moment of poetic justice, not only for her, but for every extraordinary black actress who was never properly recognized. In 2018-2019, uh, she was the first black woman to receive the honorary Oscar. And she went to receive it literally 45 years to the day uh, after she'd first been nominated for Sounder. Wow. Um, and I think after Sounder, I mean, she did some feature films after that, but nothing of that stature. And she did a lot of TV movies. Um, so it, it was something she couldn't even ha have imagined was going to happen in, in her lifetime. She called me in the evening, and she's hysterical. So all I could manage to say is, what's wrong? What's going on? Finally, she said, I just got off the phone with Larry, her manager, and the president of the Academy, and they announced that I would be receiving an honorary Oscar. And then, of course, I got hysterical. And so, in great Sicily style, she inserted levity, and she said, well, when you did the Tony dress, which I said to her, I'm going to pray to God for a vision for the Tony dress. She said, well, you went to God for the Tony dress. Who are you going to for the Oscars? <laughs> and, um, but we both knew that this was a moment. And it had to be, you know, I knew that I had to create something that would regard her for the breadth of her work. And that, as she is seen that night, will be archived in history. So I purchased this fabric a few years prior in Europe. And I bought it from a mill that did the fabrics at the time for Mr. Dior when he was alive and all of the haute couture a houses a long time ago. And the mill closed. And an agent in Europe bought whatever was left of the fabric. I had an appointment with the agent. And we're in Europe. I'm on a shopping trip for fabric getting ready to meet friends for lunch, but I stopped by the agent. I saw this fabric. I told Mark Anthony, go join our friends for lunch, and I'll be there, because I could not let him see what I was paying for this fabric. <laughs> <laughs> That's your, your husband and partner in business, Yes, Mark Anthony. and for both reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so when I worked on the dress, I thought, this is the purpose of the fabric. And the fabric is a stripe, and I did not want it to just be stripes. And so I, with my pattern draper, we took it apart. And the dress is 144 pieces. And each piece had to be swatched so that the fabric would go in a different direction. And I mean, it's insane. Don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the millinery training and your admiration for architecture, yes. which many designers have. Charles James, there are so many who. Yes, all have. those that I respect. And so that is the dress. And it's truly, you know, if there's a dress that represents my point of view, it is this single dress. Absolutely. It's absolutely magnificent. And Mark Anthony, your husband, said to you once when you said, well, I have no inspiration. He said to you, inspiration is for amateurs. Can you talk a little bit about if you can't go to the Almighty, where do you go? What does it, how does, how does that process work for you? And so that's a great question. And I sketched maybe three dresses before I ended up with this dress. And I just kept feeling like it's here, it's got to be there, it's got to be there. And one of the things I get from the statement Mark Anthony said to me was to let the dress tell you what it is. And so I just started working on the dress, and then eventually it speaks to you. It, the collection says, this is the moment, or this is the thing, this is the thought. And I just really allowed that to be this process. And I suppose that's divine. It is. It it's is. Absolutely divine. Um, we're going to be moving to Q&A very shortly. So uh, I think there are people going through with, uh, with cards, if you want to put your questions down. 
This is her final big public appearance, the Television Academy Hall of Fame in 2020, and you returned to the white blouse and the black skirt that you began with. You went back to the beginning, why? Speaking of divine, the thing is, I could not have known that that would be, that the, of course I knew the white blouse and black skirt is where we began, but on that night, which was January 28th, of 2020, mm -hmm. I could not have known that that would be our last red carpet moment. I'm wearing this jacket, that's where you've seen it before. <laughs> and, but I could not have known that. And also, January 28, 2020, exactly one year later on that exact date is when Sicily died. Yes. So all kinds of things divinely were happening in that moment. And so imagine that the bookends of the work I did for her would be white blouses and black skirts. I mean, how does that happen? That is God speaking through you. It really is. The dress telling you what is required. Uh, we have to speak about this red dress because uh, we have the great Elaine Nichols, who is a curator here, to thank for it because she told you several years ago to begin archiving. Uh, and again, the director said, we are history. You didn't even think of yourself as history. You needed a red dress for this Time 100 cover, and you went back to? So I went into my archives. This dress, so I launched my first couture collection during New York Fashion Week, fall, winter, 1999. And this dress was look one of that first collection. And I still had the dress, and now Elaine speaking to us about the importance of archiving. And so I thought about the dress because Time Magazine wanted Sicily to wear red. Yep. I did not have a red dress in the collection or in the atelier at the time. And of course, you know, we only had two or three days. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought about the dress and I cannot, I can't even tell you that I had this fabric. So the dress has no collar. And I felt like on the cover she should have, and I had this fabric, which is the same quality fabric as the dress, and draped the collar on the dress, and arrived the morning of the Time Magazine shoot with the dress in a garment bag, showed it to Sicily, and she said, I'm never taking that dress off. <laughs> and then, oh, this, we have to talk about this just very briefly. Uh, Cicely was able to witness the emergence of the world that she helped to create, post-Wakanda Black Hollywood. So here she is at the opening of the Tyler, Stu uh, Tyler Perry studio, which was on the grounds of a former, you pointed Absolutely. out, Confederate barracks. Yes, with a sound stage named after her and many yeah. other luminaries, Sidney Poitier, and I can go on and on and on. Absolutely. This is you and she in a moment of just informality, you knew that side of her. Talk a little bit about her final birthday, December 19th, these 2020. Are, yes, and these are some of our favorite moments. And that's because here there's no red carpet, no, you know, it's just about the spiritual connection that we shared. You know, she referred to Mark Anthony and herself and me as thirds. Mm -hmm. And that's a title that she gave us. And it was these moments when we could just be, you know, unguarded and laugh or cry. We attended everything that happened our, in our, each other's families. And so it's just, I, I can't even tell you. We were, I believe that's the weekend of the Oscars and we just needed a moment to decompress. And we're on the beach in Venice and Mark Anthony just happened to capture this. It's, it speaks so much to your friendship. So the night of her last birthday here on earth was um, 2020, she, 2020 yes yeah. December 19 2020 and she came to our apartment with another friend Carol at 9 30 in the evening we had sushi she even had champagne and cupcakes and we sat at the table until three in the morning I said to her when she went home, I said, when you walk past your doorman, you know, we call that the walk of shame. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty great at 96. <laughs> Pretty great at 96, but it was just, you know, spectacular that we got to celebrate that moment. Yeah. 
And this is the dress that you buried her in. Yes. You had never done a commission like that. What made you decide on the purple? What inspired this dress? I said to the uh, funeral directors that I really have to dress Miss Tyson for this occasion. And, you know, I, they were very welcoming of the idea. And Ray, as my draper, and I worked over the next series of days on this dress. And this dress, really, I put into the dress things that I knew Cicely loved about other dresses. So there is the collar that you just saw on the red dress, and she loved cuffs. And then this um, cut laser-cut fabric she also loved. I had the first dress I did for her with the laser-cut fabric, she received the Spingarn Award medal in. Which is the great award from the NAACP. It's their highest honor. Their highest honor. And purple was the color we adopted for her book tour. So we had been wearing purple, and I just thought I would continue the palette of purple. And so all of that is in this dress. And I, Mark Anthony said, are you sure you can do this in terms of dressing Sicily at the funeral home? And I said, I am not sure but I do know I do have to do this. And Cicely and I had so many of the first that this will be another of our firsts. And so it was, you know, I felt like that charge she gave me at the table that night, I have to do this zip up You walked to, to the end of the road. Absolutely. In a very beautiful way. Final thoughts. What are the great lessons that you took from your relationship with Cicely? I love that question. And Cicely, work ethic. We talked about that she never missed a show. That's a lesson. Her intention, I, it, it was her intention. I mean, I was with her, as you can you know, see, witness, I was with her at so many, all of those moments and the trust and the idea that we were indeed designer and muse. Well, a lot of that was about her intention. And so that's a, a great lesson, loyalty, friendship. I mean, just those kinds of lessons that we now must continue and put forth. So the two of you went to the opening of When They See Us, which became a mantra for you. Yes. And I want to thank you for helping the world to see us in all our splendor and for giving this queen the regal wardrobe that was the frame for the final act of her life. Now we're going to go to audience questions. Uh, has anyone considered you as their muse, similar to how Cicely Tyson was a muse to you? That's a first question. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we are all a muse to someone, because the idea is that we inspire, and that you know, we become part of whatever the narration is of that inspiration. And so, I don't know, I couldn't say for whom that is, but I would like to believe that I inspire and in such I am amused to someone. Well, and you teach, so I'm sure you're amused to a lot of your students. Yes. Can you share a story about working with Cicely Tyson that didn't make it into the book but holds a special place in your heart? Well, I can tell you a story that did not make it into the book. <laughs> and does hold a special place in my heart. And it's a personal story. And, you know, a few years earlier on in the relationship that my husband and I, Mark Anthony, now have, but earlier on in that relationship, we came to an impasse, mostly because, you know, we came from two different, Mark Anthony came from, you know, finance and a very, and then he's now in this whirlwind of fashion. And so we were at an impasse. And Cicely said, I am coming over to your apartment tonight. Whatever's going on, we need to fix it. And if you don't come, excuse me, she said, you come to my apartment. And if you don't, I will go to yours. <laughs> That's the, exactly how it went. We went to Cicely's apartment. We walked around the neighborhood for hours, like 1130, midnight. And the lesson she gave us, and part of the answer from your other question, 
was that this is not just about you, that you have been given a charge and that your relationship and your work represent something. And so get over yourselves and focus on the charge. But it's a tabernacle. That's it's, what they say when you get married in church. So. Yes. Yeah. From the virtual audience, what were some of the challenges you faced in the fashion industry? And did your relationship with Sicily help you navigate these challenges? Because there are only 3% of the designers in America are people of color. And you know, that's again speaking to Sicily's intention. The fact that she exclusively wore me to all these major big moments in her life and that I would be her escort was a statement that she was making both to Hollywood and to the fashion industry because those, quite frankly, are not opportunities that are given to black American designers. No. Well, and for the Oscars, she was besieged. Everyone suddenly, in the 70s, they weren't rushing to her. Right. But all of a sudden, everyone wanted to dress her, and they were offering to do all kinds documentaries of around yes. the dressing of. And she said, no, thank no. you. She said, if they know me, they know who's dressing me. <laughs> also from the virtual audience, and thank you for tuning in, how have you seen fashion evolve over the years of your career? And in what ways did Cicely Tyson contribute to or influence these changes? Well, I will say, having started in 1999, you know, I came on the scene seeing myself as an American designer. I was a member, I uh, had joined the CFDA, and just was very excited about being an American designer. And then you're told, you're not an American designer, you're a black designer. And, you know, responding. Because the two are exclusive. <laughs> exclusive, exclusive, of course. Yeah. Yes. And so for me, earlier on, I press would call and they would ask questions. What's it like being the only black designer showing on the fashion calendar? But after three seasons of that, I decided, unless you're calling to ask me about what's my color palette or the theme for the collection, I'm not having that conversation. Yep. I am an American designer, I am a black American designer, I have no identity crisis, but we have to talk about what it is that I do, the art. And so I believe, for me, my personal evolution, God bless, God bless. bless. <laughs> sneeze on the truth. My personal, my personal evolution is being in that space yeah. where I'm no longer apologizing and I'm focusing on my art and my charge. That's fantastic. Thank you. In what ways do you believe fashion can tell a story? In what ways do I believe fashion can tell a story? Mm -hmm. Fashion is storytelling. It's how we present ourselves. I mean, you looked at Susan tonight when she came on stage, and if you had not met her before, you automatically had some thought about who she is, which was wonderful and fabulous. <laughs> is wonderful and fabulous. But fashion is how we present ourselves. I don't think, you know, it's interesting, I always say, it wasn't until, and I say this not as a, but it was Adam and Eve who created the first need for fashion. <laughs> but the point is that fashion is, again, if you're watching a movie, we build characters using fashion. Yeah. And so if you're writing, you can use fashion as a way of describing. So I think that fashion is very narrative. And more importantly, I think you should take it as a personal, how you individually want to tell a story about who you are as a presentation. Agreed. Was there any advice or wisdom that Ms. Tyson shared with you that has been particularly impactful in your career or life? Well, I you know, mentioned already the idea of intention and the idea of a great work ethic and loyalty. And those are things that I apply to my life personally and apply you know, the level of excellence that we must put into our work. So absolutely, those things continue. Yep. Well, she always would say, I want to be able to stand before my God and say, I've done my best. I've done my best, and indeed, yes. yes. So. That's our takeaway. That is our takeaway. Yes. Well, did you want to say anything else about this beautiful Chaz guest? Did he do this posthumously? He did. We were going through photos and 
trying to figure out what the cover should be. And then the suggestion came from one of us that why not have a painting done for the cover? And Mark Anthony said, I've been reading about this painter, Chaz Guest. And I said, oh, I know Chaz Guest. He's Back like, to the community. Yes. <laughs> he said, we've been together 17 years. I didn't know you knew Chaz Guest. I said, you didn't ask me. <laughs> but we commissioned Chaz to do this painting and adopted it as the cover. And I, I can't even imagine the book without the cover. I mean, it's just so it's spectacular and, and special. Well, it captures both of you beautifully. Yeah. I also want to acknowledge a fashion icon in the audience who is another B. Swan. Dr. Joyce Brown yes. honors us with her presence tonight. President of the Fashion Institute of Technology. Another pioneer. And she's wearing a B, Michael. Yes. <laughs> And you know, there are so many, I feel so fortunate, there are so many friends and great vibration coming from the audience. I'm going to point out Dawn Davis, who is wearing a dress. She was invited by her boss at the time to go to the Met Gala. And she said to me, I want to do something around black models. And I thought, if you're going to the Met, we're going to do something around black American designers and embroidered around the train of her gown. The names like Ann Lowe, Patrick Kelly, Elizabeth Keckley, and so forth. Phenomenal. Arthur McGee Back are the names. Back to the question about telling a story. Back there to the, it is right there. There it is in and, one dress. And Don Davis, one of our great American editors, who we are very happy has left Bon Appetit magazine and come back to the world of, of publishing. Yes, where she's um, needed. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Gorgeous. Well, I think this, this concludes our evening. Yes, I'm getting the wrap up sign. Okay, okay. Well, I am so honored to be here and for all of you who came to share the moment with us and in the land of streaming, I am so grateful that you gave us this time. I know my daughters are watching, so I'll get a review later. Exactly. John Kelly will be like, okay, Dad. <laughs> but I feel um, very, very honored. And I know that for Sicily, this is important. She held the museum and the work it's doing in very high regard. And so that we can be present well, with her in no, this moment. And that she special. lived to see this yes. incredible structure. And thank you for, to Kevin Young for having us in his home. Thank in you, Denise. Home. Yes. Those beautiful introductions. Thank you to all of you for looking splendid and being a great yes. audience. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, B. Yes. And we're done. And we're done. Ladies and gentlemen, how about another round of applause for a wonderful conversation? And I hope you'll join us up uh, outside on the concourse and upstairs uh, where you can purchase uh, copies of this wonderful book pre-signed by its beautiful, wonderful author. Have a great evening. <laughs>